know, 650,000, let alone 700,000. So you always have that challenge. But what is JAM's current position about post-UTME and the universities? Let me tell you one, that the way we use data in Nigeria, I, I, I find it very uncomfortable. You are talking about 1.5, 1.7. Those who are qualified among the 1.5, 1.7, who are prima facie qualified, that is those who have the O level, they are less than 20%. Those who, large number of these students, are people who are just sitting for their examination. And at the end of the day, experience has shown that less than 1 million of these people will be qualified. If we have 750,000 uh, spaces, what we have is a mismatch. Mismatch in the sense that many people want to go into the humanities, many people want to go into the social sciences, accounting, and so on. And you have limited, space, as big, as uh, large as the uh, spaces are, they cannot accommodate all of them. But the school system is turning out, the school system in Nigeria is turning out about 40% science, at most 40% science, and 60% humanities. The policy for admission is saying 70%, in some cases, 80% must be science, and 20% or 30% humanities. So in such a situation, it's not about space. It's about appropriate uh, candidates. I don't want to be to believe, yes, we have uh, limited spaces that may not be enough for the candidates, but the situation is not as alarming as we portray it. Because I believe massification in education, and when we talk about uh, light access, yes, we are giving access as much as we can, but we need to redirect the view of people, particularly parents, who want to force their children into a particular discipline because they want to be fathers or mothers of doctors, they want to be fathers and mothers of lawyers, engineers, even when these students do not have the flair, when they do not have the capacity for it. These are issues that we must address. I believe assets must be expanded, but not at the expense of quality. The way we are going, quality is being Challenge. All right, Prof. Let, let, and, let me ask, uh, just to respond to this other part before you wrap up, uh, what's the current position in terms of who has the final say in admitting students into the schools after they've done the exams? Final say for admission rests squarely with the institutions. The institutions were established by law, and their senates and their academic boards are empowered to determine the students. What JAM does and what JAM should continue to do is to moderate, is to ensure equity, is to ensure that nobody is uh, unfairly treated. JAM should not and will not take any student that had not been recommended by the institution. JAM is not was not established to take up the responsibility or to usurp the power of the Senate. I was a vice chancellor myself, and I knew that it was not the job of, the, of, of, of JAM to uh, impose students on the institution. What JAM should do is to moderate, take recommendation, and ask questions, and ensure fairness. In terms of who gives the paper, Yes, JAM will give the admission letter. But the process of giving the letter must be democratic enough, must, be, must not encroach on the powers of the Senate and the academic boards of the various institutions. We will advise our colleagues who are manning these institutions to be fair and to play according to the rules. But we will not impose anything in terms of who has the last say? I believe the institutions have the last say. Permit me to just say this. Since you have JAM, which you had on the one hand, and you have the UTME, which the universities uh, administer, 
will it make it easier for just to have one examination body say for instance since the utme and the universities are the final word who on who gets into that school shouldn't it make more sense that they conduct examinations once and for all and select the students that have are qualified to get into those institutions instead of doing the jam don't you know as you see we we seem to forget history we seem to forget that the jam itself was proposed by vice chancellors when we had thirteen universities you we seem to have forgotten that it's because they were facing difficulty of duplication they were facing difficulty of waste of space that the vice chancellors themselves proposed that we should have jam even when we had 13 institutions not when we now have close to 500 institutions if we needed jam when we were 13 universities now i believe we needed we need jam more my own position is that we have derailed a bit the derailment in my view is my personal view is that we ought to return to what the practice used to be between collaboration, effective collaboration between JAM and the institutions. You are, we might want to recollect that until 2005, vice -chair, successive chairmen of JAM were serving vice chancellors of universities. It was only as late as 2005 that we now uh, had people who are not vice chancellors becoming chairmen of our boards, I mean jam board. What that speaks to is that the institutions were ready to collaborate, make one of them be in charge as the chairman of the board, and see whether this issue of conflict. I believe that what we have done this year, if we do it two, three times, we will achieve the same goal that you want to say. No vice chancellor, no rector, no provost can say. Now, for our examination, UTM can say, ah, we were not involved. Because the chief examiner for each state of the federation, they were serving vice chancellor, serving rectors, serving provosts. We asked them to elect from a point among them who will represent the institution, higher institution in the state. And they forwarded the names to us. And those right, names, they were the people who actually assisted us in having the level of success that we have. Very well, right. Prof. We have to anchor at that point. Uh, we appreciate your talking to us this morning. Professor Ishak Oloide is the registrar of JAM. We're back in a moment, everyone. Don't go away.